Sarah, Duchess of York, took to Twitter to show her support for the Princess of Wales after the announcement of Princess of Wales' cancer on Friday. She said, All of my thoughts and prayers are with the Princess of Wales as she starts her treatment. I know she will be surrounded by the love of her family and everyone is praying for the best outcome. As someone who has faced their own battles with cancer in the recent months, I am full of admiration for the way she has spoken publicly about her diagnosis and know it will do a tremendous amount of good to raise awareness. I hope she will now be given time, space, and privacy to heal. This year, the Princess of Wales, King Charles, and Sarah Ferguson have all been diagnosed with cancer. The Duchess of York was diagnosed with skin cancer in January, just six months after she was treated for breast cancer. Princess Catherine and King Charles have chosen not to disclose their type of cancer they have. Following her diagnosis, Sarah Ferguson pleaded with the public not to skip their cancer health checkups in a bid to raise public awareness. The Duchess, who took to Instagram to talk about her cancer diagnosis, warned that days could be the difference between life and death. The Duchess said, I would like to urge anyone who is able to be diligent with their health checkup. I'm determined to do whatever I can to help raise awareness by sharing my experience. Cancer charities and the NHS saw a surge in online visitors following Catherine's video address on Friday. Professor Peter Johnson, cancer chief at NHS England, said her brave decision to speak out will save lives. Visits to the NHS Cancer Symptoms website averaged one every three seconds in the hours that followed. That were 4,172 searches from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., more than double the usual rate. Visit to the cancer's homepage were also five times higher than normal over the 24 hours. Professor Johnson praised Catherine's decision to speak out, calling it a lifesaver. He said receiving a cancer diagnosis turns your life upside down and speaking about it can be really difficult. The Princess of Wales bravely speaking about her diagnosis will help others do the same. Thanks to this, we have seen a spike in people visiting vital information on our website about signs and symptoms. There is no doubt that talking about cancer saves lives and encourages people to come forward sooner if things are not right. I think one of the things that the Princess of Wales was thinking about when she was deciding when and how she was going to make her announcement was she wanted to be able to encourage others to go to the doctor if you're not feeling right, if you think there's something off, to seek out help in such what could be an early stage of something that could be deadly if you didn't catch it till months later. So we all give her a lot of credit in that aspect. And it is really a good thing that people are thinking a little further down the line for their own health and checking in with the NHS and the cancer websites to see if maybe they need to go into the doctor and just have their selves looked over. King Charles is to rally the nation in a powerful Easter message of hope and unity on Maundy Thursday. The 75-year-old monarch will seek to bring both the nation and the royal family together after the turbulence of recent months. The special Easter message will be broadcast at Worcester Cathedral, and a source said the king was keen to provide reassurance following the Princess of Wales' cancer announcement on Friday. The source said the king wants to reassure the public over the Easter weekend and is very much hoping to be able to lead the royal family at the church service on Sunday. Veteran royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliam suggested that the king might also decide to focus on the spiritual and the importance of family in his Easter message. He told Express, his message released at the Royal Maundy Thursday service, a favorite event of the late Queen, assumes a new importance at this unpredictable time. The message from the King will focus on the spiritual on this significant religious anniversary, but he is likely to personalize it too. The Princess of Wales in her video message talking on focusing on things which can help me heal in my mind, body, and spirit. This is an unprecedented opportunity unique to the royal family to begin across some positive ideas in a world where the lives of so many are marred by illness and conflict. The Princess of Wales stressed the pivotal importance of family, especially in tough times, and this is a possible theme for the King's message at a highly pressured time for the royal family. 
the challenges facing them are also facing a great many others. He added the king knows the importance attached to being seen and is reportedly hoping to attend the annual Easter service at Windsor. Last year, the royal family were out in force. This year's numbers will be limited, usually minimal compared to the appearance at Christmas. I, like many of you, had hoped that Princess of Wales would have been at the Easter service, but of course that was before we knew of her diagnosis of cancer. And when it comes to King Charles, he has done a couple things during his treatment for his cancer, but I wasn't sure whether or not he would be up to going to the Easter service, so we'll just have to see. I'm sure he really wants to be there, though. The Easter message will probably be a little more special and moving this year because of everything that is going on in the world and really everything that is going on internally in the royal family. One royal family member we don't hear a lot of is Peter Phillips. He is the son of Princess Anne. And I found this interview that he had given to Sky News Australia, and I thought you might be interested in it. Phillips is the only son of Anne and her first husband, Captain Mark Phillips. Alongside his younger sister, Zara Tyndall, the Phillips siblings were Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip's first grandchildren, but they were not granted royal titles at the quest of Anne. At the time of his birth, Phillips was fifth in line to the succession to the British throne, but had fallen down to the 18th physicians following the birth of his cousins and their children. Phillips is currently visiting Australia as a patriot of charity ISPS Honda, which supports disabled sportsmen and women. He sat down with an interview to talk about his mother's legacy. Both our parents have obviously been a huge influence on Zara and myself, and I think primarily is through the work ethic and both of them are incredibly hardworking. And still both of their 70s, they're still working probably a lot harder than even they expected. Everyone has a huge amount to live up to, and ultimately they live by example. Anne is one of the most popular members of the royal family with the British public and often ranked the workhorse of the Windsor family due to her heavy schedule of engagements. In 2023, Anne beat out her brother, King Charles, as the hardest working royal after ticking off a whopping 457 royal engagements in one year. Anne currently serves as patron or president of more than 300 organizations across health, sports, science, women's rights, and people with disabilities. The Princess Royal has earned even more praise in recent months after increasing her workload further to support her eldest brother during the King's cancer battle. In January, Anne and her second husband, Sir Timothy Lawrence, embarked on a multi-day tour of Sri Lanka on behalf of the British government to mark 75 years of ties between the island and the United Kingdom. Philip believes his mother's devotion to charitable causes keeps the Princess Royal energized and said he marvels at how she maintains a hectic schedule flying around the world for engagements well into her seventh decade. She still is doing overseas trips and turn around in 24 hours, which is pretty hard on most people, he said. It doesn't matter what age, but you are in your 70s and doing that is pretty remarkable. But her mindset is, listen, I can go and do what I need to do and come back. Phillips also made a rare a comment on Anne's sometimes complicated relationship with the media and said his mother has not always been a favorite in the press despite her faultless work ethic. I think in the past she was not always sort of media favorite, so to speak, but she never really let that bother her, he said. She's always just kept her head down. She's kept supporting the organizations that she wants to support. They may not be the most interesting, the most, you know, on topic as it were, but for her, that doesn't matter. She's there to support them and grow the organizations and help them develop. So she's never been one of those really worries about how many column inches she gets. That is so true when it comes to Anne. So many of her jobs, I go to look for to see what she's doing. And she doesn't get any mention, and it's very little. And it's truly sad because she really works hard for these charities and wants the attention to go to them. Not to go to her, but to get to the attention of the organizations and the charities so that they can get the donations to keep going. And having the inches in the columns of the papers or online for the articles really helps because it brings that awareness to the charity. 
There was a time when the wife of Prince Edward was something of an outsider in the British royal family. But after decades of hard work and loyal service, Sophie, Duchess of Edinburgh, has established herself as a key figure in the monarchy. If her role, reputation, and fascist choices have evolved over time, one aesthetic has remained constant in her wardrobe, the trouser suit. In the 1990s, Sophie wore the staple and oversized silhouettes, tweed fabrics, and earthy tones. Today, she explores sleek, tailored jackets and air-wide-length trousers, often paired with knee-high boots and a Breton top. Sophie Rise Joan tied the knot with Prince Edward at St. George Chapel, Windsor Castle in June of 1999, following a five-year relationship. The Duke of Edinburgh first crossed paths with his wife in 1987 when she was working in public relations for Capital Radio. Six years passed before the couple met again. This time, Sophie was leading the publicity for Edward's Real Tennis Challenge event. The duo bonded over the interest in sports, and their first date was reportedly a tennis match, followed by dinner at Buckingham Palace. As Sophie was thrust to the public eye, her style choices inevitably drew attention. In 1994, during the early stages of her relationship with Prince Edward, Sophie made a statement by wearing a distinctive wool blazer paired with matching trousers. Created in a burnt orange hue, the striking jacket featured padded shoulders, classic peak labels, a double-breasted front, and dramatically oversized. Later, in 1998, Sophie showcased her tutorial prowess in a monochrome outfit characterized by a checkered jacket for a swanky Kirk champagne party in London. The avant-garde look ensured all eyes were on the girlfriend of the Prince Edward. Already popular in the 1970s, the trouser suit went from strength to strength and continued to dominate fashion throughout the 1990s, conveying a sense of both authority and competence. Sales for the suits reached an all-time high, with a number of high-profile designers getting in on the act. Giorgio Armani, for example, created boxy two-piece for women that mirrored men's fashion. Donna Karen, meanwhile, presented designs that highlighted the female figure. Known for her awareness of style, Sophie first embraced the trend with the peplum style jackets and straight leg trousers. One particularly flattering outfit from 1998 featured a defined waist and contrasting color block collar, signifying a shift in the Duchess's attire. Attending a memorial service for Jill Dando in 1999, Sophie wore a fitted long line jacket and wide leg trousers. The plum colored ensemble featured diamond shaped buttons and decorative stitching along the front. With ever more women entering positions of authority, new silhouettes and colored palettes have been continued to develop for the trouser suit. One new variation, for example, was on a view for Sophie's visit to the 2022 RHS Chelsea Flowers Show. She captivated onlookers in a pastel pink suit complemented with a swipe of lipstick in a similar shade. The sophisticated linen number by Gabrielle Hurst comprised of a double-breasted jacket and straight leg trousers. Sophie added a Sophie Habsburg bag and with embroidered shoulder strap and a playful Penelope Chivler heels and a tan and ultraviolet. I do feel that Sophie's style has changed throughout the years. I think the suits that she wore in the 90s were, that's the style. They were oversized because it was almost like a woman wearing a man's suit to prove a point. But over the years, the suits have become more feminine and fitting, and I think they look very good on her. Also, she has started to wear a lot more dresses to her events because I think she feels comfortable in them. Sometimes you wear what you feel comfortable until you're body and the way you feel about it changes. And I think that might be the case for Sophie. Many might think she is not as stylish as other members of the royal family, but I think she's come a very long way to be a very stylish royal. Princess Anne paid tribute to Lockerbie bombing victims during a visit to Scotland on Monday. The Princess Royal visited Lockerbie Air Disaster Memorial in Dumfries today to commemorate the victims of the attack. Princess Anne was pictured laying a wreath down in front of the memorial for those who lost their lives in the tragedy. 
On December 21, 1988, an explosion on board a Boeing 747 killed 270 people. This was the deadliest terrorist attack that had been taken place in Britain at that time. The Pan Am Flight 103 was traveling from London to New York City, but exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. A time-activated bomb, which was hidden in a cassette player stored in a suitcase, detonated during the flight, killing all those on board and 11 people on the ground. During the Princess Royal's visit to Lockerbie's Garden of Remembrance, she met with representatives from the Police Scotland, Dumfries, and Galloway Council, and the Lord Lieutenant of Dumfries. Fiona Armstrong, the Lord Lieutenant of Dumfries, was a newsreader at the time of the bombing and covered the attack. The Princess also signed a visitor guest book at the center and unveiled a small plaque created for her visiting the site. Armstrong said, I was there on the night, and I was saw firsthand how the town rallied, how it copes, and how it continued to cope over the decades. You could never be more proud of a community. A disaster like this can never be forgotten. So much grief, such senseless loss, 270 innocent lives. Remember here on this memorial, each and every name will never be forgotten. Lockerbie's motto is forward, and we move together in hope. Your Royal Highness, your brother, now the King, came here following the disaster. Your mother, the late Queen, your father, the Duke of Edinburgh, also came here years after to pay their respects. And how we are honored to have you here today as the Princess Royal, but we also ask you to lay a reef, please, of remembrance. The late Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh visited Lockerbie in 1993 to attend a memorial service for those who had died in the bombing. The only person to have been convicted for the atrocity is a former Libyan intelligence officer, Albert Bastet al Margari. Libyan Abu Abdelir Mazad is also alleged to have made the bomb and goes on trial in the United States in May of 2025. A new five part series entitled Lockerbie, based on a father's search for justice after his daughter died in the bombing, began production this year. Colin Firth will play the lead role. Royal Family Unsung Hero, 5,000 royal visits, but you probably wouldn't recognize her. One lesser-known royal who has been quietly and graciously attending engagements throughout her years of service, despite not having expected to do so, when she married into the royal family in 1972. The Duchess of Gloucester has kept a largely unseen profile within the royal family, despite having attended around a remarkable 5,000 engagements during her 40 years of service. Danish-born Brigitte recently resurfaced in the spotlight as she attended a handful of events alongside Queen Camilla, recently and just as King Charles and Princess Catherine underwent cancer treatment. The Duchess, on March 12th, was joined the Queen and the Queen Matilde of Belgium for a reception at Buckingham Palace to mark International Women's Day. In February, she helped Camilla hand out the Queen's anniversary prizes to university and colleges. She also joined her when she was made honorary liveryman of Worshipful Company of Fan Makers. The former secretary has never given an interview or courted publicity. However, she has an extensive portfolio of 60 charities to which she devotes a large portion of her time promoting and supporting. And while the King and Princess Catherine's absence might have sparked hopes for lesser royals to step up and juggle the workload, in case of the Duchess and her husband, Prince Richard, the Duke of Gloucester, the prospects seem highly unlikely. The 77-year-old has attended 16 engagements this year so far, as of March 25th, and is on course for about 60 this year, after carrying out 110 last year, according to reports. Meanwhile, the Duke has attended 35 engagements and is expected to undertake about 150 events, compared to 190 the year before. But even this amount of engagements would be seen as many as quite the number as Brigitte never expected to fully devote herself to the monarchy when she married Prince Richard in July of 1972. The pair met a few years earlier in Cambridge, where Brigitte attended a finishing school, and then Prince Richard of Gloucester, was an undergrad reading architecture at Cambridge University. Before Cambridge, the Duchess was educated in Odensense, where she was born, and in a finishing school in Lausanne, as well as the Scandinavian Academy of International Fashion and Design in Copenhagen. 
However, six weeks after their wedding, his older brother and heir apparent to the dukedom, Prince William of Gloucester, was killed in a flying accident near Wolverhampton. Thus, the couple became the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester upon Richard's father's Prince Henry's death in 1974. Brigitte has always approached her sense of duty and worked graciously, having previously said, as members of the royal family and in our public life, the Duke and I have a huge privilege and continuously many people greatly committed to the work with charitable causes, many individuals being volunteers doing all kinds of good work giving their time, talents, and expertise. It is inspiring and immensely rewarding meeting these volunteers on my varied engagements in London and throughout the country. The Duke and Duchess of Gloucester have three children, the Earl of Ulster, born in 1974, the Lady Davinia Lewis, born in 1977, and Lady Rose Gilman, born in 1980, all of whom are married and have children of their own.